Hello again. Welcome in the second block of our session. We are in a Bronze Age, the most exciting time to be in. And we will continue with the several key topics that are probably one of the most important in a studies of uh, Bronze Age economy. My name is Dalia Pokuta. I'm from Stockholm University. I'm working primarily with the... Uh, Thank you. I'm working primarily with the isotopic research, uh, recently also in uh, genetics. But my main subject of interest is the unit is the culture. But today I would like to tackle, I would like to tackle a very broad subject. I can imagine clearly the, the world without money. When we talk about barter exchange, when we talk about buying and selling things on a regular basis. But today when we live here, we can't really imagine the world without grain. And when we imagine the topic of grain in archaeology, this is an immense topic. This is an ocean of different things. It starts very early during the Neolithic, but, but it goes bigger and bigger when we reach the Roman times. When we go beyond that, it goes even, even bigger. So there's a question, how can you tackle such a grand issue in a 15 minutes time? I will show you the way I decided to take it. But this is a kind of experiment. So this is a, a trip through the world of grain. I would like to imagine the Bronze Age in a slightly different way. I would like to imagine the, the Bronze Age where the metals, the bronze, matters less than before. I would like you to imagine something which I call the food system, the food system of the Bronze Age. And I'm making three basic assumptions. My first assumption is that, that the agriculture is, uh, agriculture is fundamental to the Bronze Age. My second assumption is that the food system is a complex web of activities involving the production, processing, transport, and consumption. Issues concerning the food system include the governance of, uh, and the economics of food production, the degree to which the food is wasted, how the, the, the food production affects the natural environment in a given territory, and what is the overall impact of the food upon the given society. My third assumption in that experiment is that Bronze Age food system is linked to global technological changes of the era, climate changes, and uh, that it has an overall impact on the concentration of power and uh, creation of power systems in, um, in the Bronze Age world. And how this thing, the food system, can be manifested in archaeological records? We can see uh, three basic manifestations of that. First of that is the residue of the grain you find in a, on your site, the remains of the food products that were traded in the, uh, in the Bronze Age. The second is the remains of the consumers, the people who actually created those surpluses and who consumed the surpluses. And the final product is the waste pit, where everything lands up by the end of the process. So we can see a circular uh, process where something comes in and something comes out. It's like a circle of dependency. If I imagine that kind of thing, I, I, I would like to call it the core mechanism of the Bronze Age. The, the mechanism of the creation of the surplus of the food that gives the possibility for us, for the prehistoric populations, to actually develop new fields of interest, to develop uh, transportation methods, to develop metallurgy on a grander scale than before. And this, this system can be visualized like a, a perpetual mobile, as, as a circle. On the one hand side, we can see environmental drivers, climate, type of soil, water, and, and that part will be different in different parts of Europe or, or, or in a given place on the, on, the, on the planet. Populations are living in a different times, in a different climate zones and so on. On the other hand side, we see socioeconomic drivers. So quite frankly speaking, it's a demography of the given population. How, uh, how big the group of the people really is, how fast it can expand through the centuries. We can see also natural events that are happening during the Bronze Age. Volcanoes, climatic changes. And I'm going to come back to that because the Bronze Age is a very specific period that is suspended in between three major 
climatic changes. At the beginning of the Bronze Age, 3200, we have a climatic change. In the middle, we have Terra eruption and Santorini uh, volcanic winter. And by the end of the Bronze Age, we have again, in the Hallstatt period, the climate is changing. But everything in that diagram comes back to food security, the access, availability, and the utilization of food production in general. The Bronze Age was perhaps the most exciting time uh, in agriculture, in agriculture since the invention of, of farming thousands of years before. And I would like to show you the selection of six major agricultural innovations that shaped the productivity of, of that era. First thing, obviously, is an alloy, is the, is the possibility of having metals, something better than stone, something dur more durable than, than the wooden implements, especially in agriculture. Uh, the second thing is high temperature, high temperature ovens and the new food, uh, and the new food um, processing techniques. And during the bronze, I mean, uh, the thing with, uh, with the ovens, we do know that the ovens have been found already in the Paleolithic. We have a site in Dolni Vestonice, in Czech Republic, where Zvelebil has found first ovens dated to 23,000 years BC. But during the Bronze Age, we have a, a massive technological change that is actually shaping uh, the new abilities of, of building up better ovens with better temp temperature range. And during the Bronze Age, they also have better control of the fuel, fueling and the temperature range with it, within, that, uh, within that field. Majority of that goes into metallurgy, but in a Bronze Age kitchen, the ladies could actually fry and, and bake stuff more efficiently than during the Neolithic. The third thing is the sale. I'm saying the sale because, in fact, I mean um, a silent revolution. During the, the Bronze Age, we are witnessing the silent revolution in uh, water transportation. And uh, we have an evidence that during the Middle Kingdom, 11 to 13 dynasty, the Egyptians invented a new type of sale, which was more efficient it was giving a bigger speed, and they, they managed to build bigger ships than before. And from the records in the Egyptian history, we know that Tutmosis III was able to have a, a big fleet of ships, very like ships, and he was using them in a battle, in a warfare situation. But when the ships were not used in a warfare, they were used to transport grain. And millions of them were, were traversing the Nile from top to the bottom, but in general, in the whole Europe, as we could see in the Neolithic presentation, we could see that the people are preferred to use canoes. They're easier. You can't reach certain territories on a horseback, so water everywhere. The fourth thing, the plow. We have three basic types of plows known from the Neolithic. Of course, it's very difficult to date them. Sometimes we find them in a context, we find them on the Neolithic sites, but in general, we, we, we can conclude for today that we have, until the Bronze Age, we have three major, major types of plows, and the differences between them rely in um, stability. We can say an in, innovation going through the plowing, because they are trying to develop the plow that is heavier and is more stable. So during the Bronze Age, we have several iconographic representations of the new types of plow, some of them from Sweden, but also from Mediterranean, where we can see that they are actively working on getting better stuff. The last three things uh, is relating to the plants. And it's based partially on the paleontological pal uh, evidence and partially on the things we see later on in the early Iron Age. We see massive in intensification in the production. And we have new studies from Germany, they've been published recently, two years ago, where um, we can see that the number of different wild crops is changing, this broad, is, is uh, broadening the spectrum of, of appearance on the fields. So we can see that actually the Bronze Age farmers, they begin to play with the plants. The main aim is less work, more benefit. And this is the moment when we can start to see the changes in the regime of plants being uh, cultivated during the springtime and in the winter time to uh, avoid uh, to, to try to prevent the erosion of the 
of the land. Introduction of the new plants in ecological and ecological flexibility. I said before that the Bronze Age is suspended in between different climatic events. And in a more global scale, they are the, crucial, the most crucial factors. But you can't really see them in archaeological record unless they manifest themselves as a huge destruction of, of some kind of, uh, or, or there's some kind of dramatic event. But during the, during the Bronze Age, we have the moment when the Bronze Age might have ended. And quite seriously, there might have been the moment when the Bronze Age was no longer present. And this is Santorini eruption. And in that time, we can see a, a lot of things changing in Europe. We have a lot of warfare. We have changes in metallurgy. But in the agriculture, we see introduction of millet. And there is a reason behind that, because the massive eruption of the Santorini resulted in 100 year, years period of volcanic winter. So try to imagine 100 years or 200 years of permanent failure of crops, devastating famine. Uh, no, you, you cannot longer grow wheat or barley because it makes simply no sense. And even if you manage to cultivate something, the war is coming and is taking everything. And in that moment, the Bronze Age is actually showing the, the flexibility beyond any, uh, any level. They introduce a millet, which is very resistant crop, crop that you can grow on pretty much any type of soil, the crop that can feed both horses and humans. And this crop is going to uh, dominate the staples in the following centuries in the Iron Age. And the last thing is, is the Mediterranean trade. Uh, three, um, now, three types of crops appear in the in Mediterranean area, olives, cereals, and wine. And today, when we look at the cuisine from Greece, we can't imagine that area without those plants. So this is the moment when that trend is happening. But there is something more. There is also a sacralization of agriculture and food production in the Bronze Age. This is the moment when the agriculture becomes something essential for the creation of power. The good king is the king, is the king that can feed the people. And we can see that pretty clearly in Egypt where the iconography of the pharaonic era is going strongly in that direction. In the Bronze Age Europe, we can see that the plowing is used both to, to plow the fields, but also to, um, uh, during the construction of the barrows. We can find the scratch marks under the barrows. We can see that certain items associated with um, agriculture can be found in the barrows. For example, in the United culture, we find um, we find um, saddle querns and barrows that indicates the connection with the agriculture, the concept of power going into the land. And we have the first time we have the gods appearing, the appearance of the gods of fertility, known, known by names, Tammuz, for example, in Mesopotamia, very popular. But my favorite god is Nepri, it's a less known god of Egypt. Uh, this is the god of grain and germination. And it was depicted as an older male, covered whole, uh, his skin was covered with grain. And uh, this god is associated with the Egyptian concept of happiness and fertility and never ending life. But during the Bronze Age, something really bizarre happens with Nepri. During the Bronze Age, Nepri. Become, his, his cult is confirmed since the 5th dynasty, so since, so since the Old Kingdom. But during the Bronze Age, Nepri becomes the aspect of Osiris. So, so Osiris, the main god of the Pantheon, is taking, is taking the, the features of Nepri, becoming the major source of life and also pharaonic power. And at the end, I would like to have a brief look at the how isotopic perspective can be incorporated in that picture. On the one hand side, you can see a referential book by Harding and Falkens, where, where they summarize the overall picture of the Bronze Age, or rather the things we choose to believe in about the Bronze Age today. And in that book, when you go from culture to culture, you're going to see very typical um, description of the agricultural regime. So all Bronze Age cultures in that book are described pretty much as they kept cattle, pigs, and sheep, and they cultivated crops. And that 
uniform description appears over and over again. And that creates the situation like every Bronze Age culture looks the same. And if they all look the same, what is changing? Obviously, you impede yourself from asking new questions if you, if you define the problem like this. So I mapped 207, uh, 210 skeletons. I've been working recently uh, in, um, in an isotopic research. And I'd, I would like to briefly show you how diverse the dietary trends in the Bronze Age really are. We have 210 people coming from different Bronze Age cultures. The yellow part uh, represents the typical Neolithic diet. This is the, the bulk, my comparison from. In the blue segment, you're going to see the unit is a culture from Poland, which has very sharp rise in the, in the nitrogen values. They are manuring the fields. In the red segment, you're going to see Bohemian groups of the same culture. The same culture, 200 kilometers further to the south, they are not manuring, they are doing something, something else. In the pink quarter, you're going to see late Bronze Age Greece, which is actually following very, very uh, maladaptive tendency. The, in the late Bronze uh, Age Greece, people d decided not to eat fish, because fish seems to be, they became picky. They don't want to eat everything that goes. They select things, and this is also the thing about Bronze Age. In the Neolithic, you have to eat what goes. And usually it's forage. And during the Bronze Age, things go, go more complicated and you may choose. And, but in order to have opportunities to choose, you have to have surplus, right? And in that last part, this is the moment of change. I've mentioned uh, Santorini eruption. The, the, the black dots represent Tumulus culture from also Czech Republic. And you can see entirely different regime. They are growing millet because they have to. So it will be a, my brief experiment as well for me. Thank you very much.